So, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our next speaker to the stage. He is an American physician, vegan health educator and conference speaker. He served on the Nutrition and Preventative Medicine Task Force of the American Medical Student Association. He's an author of books such as Vegan Nutrition, Pure and Simple, and Pregnancy, Children and the Vegan Diet. I'm sure that you, along with me, have seen him appear in several films related to veganism, including Eat This, Cowspiracy, and of course, What the Health. Let's please give a massive vegan clap out welcome to Dr. Michael Clever! And it was such a delight to see everybody you met on the staircase, everybody in line to get meals, they're all vegan. Yeah. Like you, everybody knows, knows that word, everybody knows the power and the beauty of the concept of being vegan. <laughs> and we would go on these shore excursions and the first excursion where the ship stopped was an island off the coast of Germany called Rügen. A lovely island, beautiful island. A busload of us got off uh, on, onto, the, uh, onto the bus and, uh, and our German tour guide took us around, showed us the sights, and on the way back, he made some joke, a kind of a bragging joke, about how Rugen produced the best meat and cheese on the island uh, in Germany, and that he pointed at a couple in the front of the bus, said, afterwards, I'll take you to the best meat and cheese shop on the island. Silence. <laughs> so because they were Americans, you have to speak louder, right? So he said, I'll take you to the best meat and cheese shop on the island. No response. Finally, one of the other couples took pity on him and leaned over and said, they're, they're, they didn't respond, they're vegan. And oh, his eyes lit up, oh, and he turned to everybody on the bus, do you know you got a couple of vegans here on the bus? He <laughs> leaned over and said, everybody on the bus is vegan. And he, his eyeballs went around like Las Vegas slot machines. He couldn't. I have a bus full of vegans. Yeah, you do. A whole bus full of vegans, I am. Yeah, you do. And then we lead him and said, if you think a bus full of vegans is a lot, you wouldn't believe what's down in the harbor. We got a whole ship full of vegans. I wish we could take that man and bring him here. It would blow his freaking mind. How wonderful, Israel. What a statement. I became vegan in 1981. It was 
was a very different world back then, say the least. And I was working as a resident in anesthesiology and I was in the operating room working on people's hearts and blood vessels and every day uh, I would watch surgeons open up the arteries of the heart and pull out this yellow guck that looked like chicken fat. And one day the little voice on my shoulder said, there's a good reason why it looks like chicken fat. It is chicken fat. And cow fat and pig fat. And my dad died of clogged arteries. I knew I was going to be on that operating table with that striker saw going up my sternum. Didn't want that. <clears throat> Later on, I was out to dinner with a friend of mine. I had been reading the works of Gandhi and the Indian saints about living a nonviolent life. And, and I was pontificating about the virtues of nonviolence while I was polishing off a porterhouse steak. And my friend with great compassion said, it's all very nice, Michael, but if you want to reduce the violence in your life, you might start with that piece of meat on your plate because in satisfying your desire for that taste of flesh in your mouth, you are paying for the death of the animal and for the next one in line in the slaughterhouse. And as soon as he said that, all the old rationales came, oh, well, that animal's dead already, and that's what they raised them for, and all of that came in my mind. But before the words could get out of my lips, the little voice on my shoulder said, you know, he's right, he's right. And I, when I went up to pay for the state, then I felt complicit in a crime. Because I knew I was, there was a reason that animal died, and I was it. So that was the last piece of meat I ate. And I went home, and I had been raised in a Jewish household after World War II. And as I was putting on my leather shoes and my leather belt, I remembered the pictures I saw of the lampshades made out of the skins of the Jews. And, and the leather felt to me. I, 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 I couldn't put it on. So, so I went in the backyard and I took a spade and I dug a hole and I put my leather shoes and my leather belt my leather wallet uh, in and I buried them deep and covered the hole up. And as I stepped back, I apologized to the animals uh, if you don't know, you don't know. But once you know, you got, you got an obligation. And so, and so the era of hemp wallets and uh, leather shoes began in my life, which is fine. And a few weeks later, I was relating this to a friend of mine, and what I had gone through, and she says, oh, you become a vegan. I had never heard the word. But as soon as she said it, I knew. <laughs> And it sounded good. I like the sound of the word. Yeah. And I've been proudly vegan ever since. And as the larger context of what this concept really means made itself imprinted on my soul and on my spirit, I knew that I had an obligation to let this permeate every aspect of my life. I stopped eating meat and dairy. My body loved it. A 20 pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist in 12 weeks. My high blood pressure went to normal. My high cholesterol went to normal. I felt great waking up in a nice lean body every day. And I knew I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist and spend my life putting people to sleep. I'd rather go back to general practice and help them wake up. <laughs> so I did, with six months to go in my residency, much to the dismay of my parents, um, I left my residency and went back to general practice. And started using plant-based nutrition as the key to my therapy, and the same wonderful things happen in my patient's body. And I'll share some of those with you in a few minutes, but I've been a plant-based physician ever since. 
and medicines, I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthy, right in front of my eyes. But I have an obligation to make sure that everyone who chooses the vegan path lives the most physically healthy life they can. Uh, sick, overweight vegans uh, aren't a good advertisement for our larger mission here. And for that reason, I've uh, developed quite an interest in plant-based physiology. And I want to share with you a couple of ideas tonight um, about uh, maintaining a healthy, lean body on a plant-based diet. Before we get into the science of it, and there won't be much science here, <clears throat> um, I just want to again express something that you already know, but it's also for the new people who are here who are just checking out being vegan or who've recently become vegan, and the magnitude of this is seeping into your life and your existence. I just want to put up in uh, I was going to say black and white, but it'll be gold and blue, <laughs> about what being vegan means to me and why it is so important. Because from the minute my eyelids open in the morning, I, it's my joy, my honor, to live a vegan life during that day. Because to be vegan means to move lovingly through this world. Every action that you take, everybody you meet, every thought that you have, how can I add more love to the scene? Because that's always the answer. Even, when, even in the emergency room with the patient bleeding, still love is needed there. And, and being vegan is square one when it comes to love, if you're really letting it permeate through your body, through your life. If you're not familiar with the term ahimsa, it's a Hindi term meaning nonviolence, means do no harm. As you go through life, don't hurt anyone. If you can't make things better, at least don't hurt anything. And hopefully you'll leave it better. Because in its highest sense, being vegan, and I can speak with some authority as a professional healer, then vegans are healers of this world. We're the folks who want things to be okay. We want everybody to be okay, no matter how many legs you have. No matter how, if you've got wings or you don't, we want you to be okay. We want this world to be okay. And our decisions, what we do and what we don't do, is all the cause of healing this world, of healing the life around us. So the vegan stance, when we enter any scene, if you're truly vegan, the thought, whether it's in words or just your feelings, the, the real thought and feeling inside is, how can I help? What can I do to make things better? That's the vegan approach to life. There's the vegan approach to healing, to loving, to parenting, to friending, to husband and wifing. How can I help? How can I make things better? If, if that is the, the place from which your words come from, your thoughts, your actions, then you can truly and proudly call yourself, yes, I'm vegan. The topics I want to cover in this next 30 minutes or so I want to talk about what a healthy daily diet is that will keep you out of the clutches of people like me. Uh, I've got elevated cholesterol. I've got vegans with high cholesterol levels, and I want to talk to you about that. It's quick, but it's something you need to know. There's an issue with overweight vegans. Um, I've met quite a number of them, and they don't say anything. I don't say anything, but I know it's an issue, and I want to talk about what might be keeping a vegan who stopped eating the meat and dairy, why they're still heavy, and give you some ideas about how to overcome that. You probably, many of you probably heard on the news, uh, there's now a big kerfuffle that, that vegans don't get enough choline in their uh, 
uh, in their diet, and I'm talking about choline. A quick stop in paleo land uh, to deal with that one. And then, of course, um, the larger picture, which is really what we're here for. So that's uh, what we're going to cover. Hopefully, some of you will get something out of at least one of these points uh, as the talk unfolds. What do we eat? We eat what grows out of the ground, what the planet and nature gives us. Your daily diet should be a whole, underlying whole, like it grew out of the garden, like, so you could recognize it in the, oh, that's a lettuce. That's, those are beets, that's a carrot, whole plant foods. All plant foods and as vital and real as you can get them. You want a big fresh salad every day. <clears throat> if you eat breakfast, and you don't have to, if you're not hungry, don't eat. But if you're hungry, then have a hearty breakfast, have some fruit, you have some porridge, works. Uh, during the day, if you want at least one big fresh salad, as colorful as you can make it with every garden vegetable that you can put in there. Two salads are even better. And the rest of your meals should be glorious, colorful soups and, and chilies and curries and stir fries made of these lovely whole fresh uh, vegetables and the whole grains, quinoa, uh, millet, buckwheat, farro, there's a whole world of, of whole grains. Make sure you have something leguminous, uh, legume, uh, pulses here, uh, uh, pretty much every day, whether it's a hummus sandwich or a scoop of lentil stew or a cup of bean chili, something that, that's where the protein richness really is. And then for desserts, uh, the whole world of colorful fruits, uh, have a mango, have papayas, have a smoothie, uh, lots of uh, things that grow on trees, pretty color, easy to recognize uh, for, uh, for your sweet tooth. This should be your daily fare. This will keep you lean and healthy and out of hospitals and off of operating tables. It's become almost one word, eh? What do you mean, a whole food blending about? Uh, uh, but yeah, a whole food, whole plant, plant-based diet. That's really what you want to eat. It's probably pretty obvious to most of you, I hope, this is what your daily fare really looks like. The reason I mention it is because now we have been, our efforts have been reinforced by this remarkable regimen of plant-based meat analogs that are absolutely remarkable. Uh, the folks at, uh, at Impossible Foods and, and uh, uh, Beyond Meat and all those folks have really perfected, as you probably know, a plant-based burger that really tastes like meat. Uh, the folks at Good Catch have a tuna uh, made of chickpeas, uh, but it's, it tastes pretty tuna-y. Uh, and, uh, and what remarkable things that uh, the, uh, the pork producer is coming up with here, plant-based uh, nutrients, uh, plant-based burgers, uh, the impossible chicken now, or chicken tacos. They're these, one, these amazing foods, and they really entertain your tongue. They're wonderful. But we also can't kid ourselves about what they're made of. They're, these are highly processed food, and they, there's a lot of concentrated processed protein and vegetable oil holding them together. And not something you want to run through your bloodstream two, three times a day, day after day after day. Uh, now, I'm very grateful to have these foods around. If it helps Joe meat and potato guy get off his beef burgers and, and have a veggie burger, bless him. And, and bless the folks from Possible Foods. They're a wonderful transition food. But for those folks already vegan who want to be healthy, just put this in, these foods in the category of, of treats, of novelty foods. Once a week, yeah, you can have a, an Impossible Burger. Um, but easy does it. Your, your daily fare should be whole grains, fruits, vegetables, as I showed you in the previous slide. These are treat foods. These are special occasion foods. Now this is at just one hell of a special occasion. Uh, so, it's 
So blessings on all those amazing food booths that you got down here. I can see them as far as the eye can see. Uh, and they're wonderful. And enjoy them and savor them and have fun with them. But realize this in the context of this special event. When you get home, fire up your crock pot, make some dynamite and chilies and stews and soups and have a big salad going in the fridge, uh, get, to get your uh, quinoa cooker out and uh, have a big bowl of quinoa uh, ready to go and, uh, and make the whole plant-based foods that will really nourish your body and keep you out of medical trouble. So uh, I'm not against these, but they're this much of your diet. Okay. When people become vegan, and I've watched that happen now for 38 years as a physician, I've seen people adopt a vegan diet. The changes are jaw-dropping. They are, as they say in New Zealand, they're eye-watering sometimes. It's so dramatic. Within days, the obesity starts to melt away, the arteries open up, the high blood pressure comes down, the joints stop hurting, the psoriasis skin clears up, the migraine headaches reduce or go away, the asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much, uh, and they turn into normal healthy people who don't need a lot of pills and procedures uh, and potions to be healthy. And this is the legacy, this is the gift that the, that the animals give us for not eating them. The, we'll make you a trade. You want a healthy body? Well, you know, let us live our lives, we'll let you live uh, a healthy life as well. And the vast majority of folks, especially the folks who start out heavy, they'll tell you their stories here. There are lots of lean people here, and many of them will tell you, I used to look like the girl on the left or the guy on the, on the, on the right side here. So this is normally what happens. And to my medical colleagues, I have to introduce the concept of disease reversal. Because my colleagues, who spend the majority of their time dealing with this small group of grim diseases, the obesity and the clogged arteries, the high blood pressure, the type 2 diabetes, and strokes and asthma, etc., they think, well, we don't know the cause. Etiology unknown. Etiology is not unknown. It's the frickin' food they're eating. And I've been going around to the medical schools in North America, Canada, and Mexico. I've been to Australia, New Zealand, and I'm trying to, and I've given a couple of talks over here to medical audiences, saying these are reversible diseases, every one of these. All of us who practice plant-based medicine have a stable full of patients who used to be obese, who used to have high blood pressure, who used to have diabetes, who used to have clogged arteries, who used to have lupus, who used to have asthma. These diseases go away. They are reversible diseases. And in my presentation to the med students and to the doctors, I, I click the slide and the line says, do you want to heal these patients or don't you? You want to heal them, why would you go into medicine in the first place? You want to heal these people? Because if you're just going to have them come back every month to renew their prescription for statins and for high blood pressure pills and not get real about why they're sitting in front of you, obese, clogged up and hypertensive and diabetic and inflamed, if you're not going to be honest with them, then you're not fulfilling your responsibility as a physician. Tell me, well, you want to heal these patients or don't you? If you do, then give them a referral to Ms. Jones, the plant-based dietitian down the hall or wherever she has her office. Let her show them the videos. Let her show them what to eat. Let her take them shopping. Um, let her stock their freezer up or help them stock their freezer up. And you see them back in a month. And if they're not feeling better, losing weight, then you got to talk about what they're really eating. But you watch how well they're going to do just by getting them on a plant-based diet. That's how medicine should be practiced in the 21st century. So, again, if you're, if you're just new here, burn this one into your cranium here. This, this is what you ought to be eating on a daily basis. And if so, these diseases generally go away. 
Now, I do have people who've been vegans for years and their cholesterol levels going up. And they're very concerned. And the question is, what's going on? And does it really matter? Because it's true, the cardiologist will tell us that the folks with high cholesterol get the strokes. So let's pound down those cholesterols with statins and hopefully they won't get their stroke or their heart attack. Only about 25% of people on statins actually get any benefit at all. Three quarters of the people still go on to get strokes and heart attacks and blue legs, etc. And the reason why this happens, I'll tell you in a minute, but because time is short, I'll just tell you. Uh, I put a video on my website on drclapper.com called Beyond Cholesterol, and I go into this in detail. It's a, it's a free video. Well, watch it. You'll, you'll get the idea. But the, the upshot of the video is that the atherosclerotic plaques that build up in your arteries are not just globs of grease that stick to the artery walls because your LDL is too high. These are inflammatory lesions. These arteries are being injured. Meal after meal of fried meats and high fructose corn syrup and fried vegetable oil and uh, and phosphoric acid in cola drinks, and cigarette smoke, and stress hormones, and air pollution, and all the processing chemicals that are inherent in all the artificial foods we're eating. This is the chemical assault that injures the wall of the artery that, uh, that, pro that prompts the plaque formation in the first place. The patient is not a, a random victim that, oh, my LDL is too high, so I'm developing plaque. No, sir, this is artery abuse. It's the, it's the way the owner of the arteries are treating the arteries is why this plaque is forming there. These are inflammatory lesions. And, they, and the, we go into in the video about the, more about how these form. But again, the invitation is not to, uh, not to play passive victim, but also the most important thing, that is if this is your diet, if meal after meal you are sending a flood, a torrent of the antioxidants and the phytonutrients that are in the green and yellow vegetables and in the legumes and the whole grains. If you are bathing your artery walls with these reparative molecules and you have yanked out the meat and the dairy and the fried chicken and the, and the processed oils and all that, you pulled that out and you've put whole plant foods in, in their place, then every meal your bloodstream gives the message to your artery walls, shh, calm down, it's okay. Arteries heal, <clears throat> even if the cholesterol is up. I'm sure most of you have seen this classic picture from Dr. Esselstyn's studies. And the picture on the left is an artery in the heart, uh, and where it says distal LAD, that rat-eaten appearance are, is caused by plaques of, of atherosclerosis encroaching into the, into the artery wall. This man went on a whole food plant-based diet, 22 months, and in that time, that artery turned into the artery on the right. Same man, same, same artery. Okay? These plaques melt away, depending on how the owner of the artery is treating those arteries. Cholesterol is not an evil molecule. Your liver makes it. So your adrenal glands can make cortisol and your ovaries can make estrogens. Your testes, if you have them, make testosterone. It's not an evil molecule. <clears throat> and if on a given day your, your liver wants to keep a little extra cholesterol in your blood, it's not a disease if you are a vegan eating a whole food plant-based diet. The, the actual number of the cholesterol doesn't matter a heck of a lot. So to the whole food, plant-based eating vegans, I'll tell you, relax. Now that said, choline, the molecule we'll be talking about, is, is one of the molecules that helps lower cholesterol. 
and there's cholesterol and there's choline in soy products, there's choline in broccoli, uh, and I'll suggest my patients eat uh, an extra helping of soy uh, and an extra helping of broccoli to bump up their choline level, but that's it. I don't put people on statins. Uh, and so if you are a vegan, and your cholesterol's a bit up, watch my video, you'll understand what you're looking at, uh, and you'll get, learn why you can relax, but just keep those whole plant foods going through your arteries, and the chance of you getting a stroke or a heart attack are about zero squared. Okay? Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important for us vegans to, you know, we're not a popular group, uh, in case you haven't run into that. And it's a funny thing, you know, homo sapiens. Sapient, the word sapient means wise, you know, we're the wise one, that's what the word means. Oh boy, what a misnomer uh, of a name. But. Um, but, but being vegan to our non-vegan friends, they feel judge, that we're judgmental. The very fact you're vegan, there's a judgment on their diet and their lifestyle. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a, it makes people uncomfortable. And you don't have to say anything. The less you say, the, the better. The most important thing is who you are, how you act, and how you look. And the statement that your body makes when you walk in the room. So, for that reason, and for, and, and for all the overweight vegans, God love you that you're, that you're here, that, you're, that, you're, that you care enough about yourself and about the animals and, and about the planet that got you to that point of adopting a vegan diet. You deserve um, a, a, a leaner, healthier body uh, and because obesity, and I know there's the whole thing about fat shaming or whatever, but obesity is a state of inflammation. The abdominal belly fat makes inflammatory molecules that set off inflammation throughout the body. Obesity is not a state of health. And so we need to talk about the, the riddle of the overweight vegan. And is it the fat? Is it the carbs? Let me, let me sort this out for you. So a little ankle wade into science land here. It won't be much though. Carbs, fats versus carbs. What, what are carbs? The word is carbohydrate. And what is the word telling us? The word, the something, hydrate. To hydrate something is to add water to it. And if you hydrate a carbon compound, you've created a carbohydrate. That's what the word means. So here's a molecule of water. Uh, it's an oxygen with two hydrogens on it, and its formula is HOH. Why am I telling you that? Because here's some sugars, and on the left is this one's called glucose, and these two blue arrows you'll notice are pointing on the left. Uh, there's an HOH hanging off on the left uh, with the second arrow, HOH. Over here, HOH, HOH. There's water molecules hanging on these carbon rings. That's what makes them carbohydrates. Okay? and they've got energy stored in them. And when we eat them, they burn cleanly. They just turn into carbon dioxide that we breathe out and water that we excrete, and we just harvest the sun's energy that went into these, uh, uh, into these wonderful carbon rings. The plants, like potatoes, will make these sugars, but to get through the winter, they take the sugars and, and link them into long chains and long chains of sugar molecules are called starch. And when we eat the potato, when we eat the rice or the millet, then the enzymes in our saliva and our pancreas break those bonds and liberate the individual sugars, and we get to burn them in our muscles, and yay, uh, we get energy out of the plants. And we'll take some of those sugar molecules and we will store them in our muscles. <clears throat> Carbohydrates, I hope you're starting to understand, are not evil. Okay? There's the daily fuel that our muscles run on. We are carbohydrate burning organisms. The Krebs cycle enzymes in your mitochondria burn sugars, not fats. Sugars, we're sugar burning organisms. 
Now the body will store these sugars in our muscles in the form of glycogen and the energy, my muscles now that I'm talking with and I'm moving with, I'm burning glycogen stored in the muscles from the potatoes I ate last night. The, the sugars in those starches are in my muscles and we, we burn, we draw down on our glycogen stores in the muscles, then we eat some carbohydrates and we replace it. It's like the battery in the hybrid car the, and when you're run, driving around the city. You draw down on your glycogen stores, you build them back up again. We are clean burning carbohydrate organisms. Carbs are not evil, it's our daily fuel. Carbohydrates, notice however, in the upper left hand corner, whole carbohydrates in their whole form are high. In their, nature uses carbohydrates to make roots and leaves and stems and fruits, so uh, there's always, all whole plant foods are high carbohydrate foods, but they're mostly water. They're mostly fiber, they're full of vitamins and minerals, and they've got clean burning sugars. It's the fuel we're supposed to run on. That's why vegans live long, healthy lives. Carbohydrates in these forms are not evil. <laughs> but carbohydrates in this form, these are evil. When they refine the carbohydrates and they turn them into cakes and candies and, and soft drinks and fruit juices, these sugars leap into your bloodstream, they stick to proteins all over the body, they age your tissues. Refined carbohydrates are the problem. But the sloppy folks in paleo land, they, they say, oh, all carbs are bad, all carbs are bad, when they're really talking about these refined carbohydrates. But they take that big broad brush, and, oh, all carbohydrates are bad. No, they're not, they're our daily fuel, as long as they're in their whole form that grew out of the ground. Now, that said, you do not need to, to fear carbohydrates in their whole form. They will not turn into fat. They cannot turn into fat. Your body is not going to take a glucose ring like that, break it apart to get the energy, then grab the fragments and start linking them together with a bunch of enzyme steps to make these long chain fats. Body's not going to do that. They're way too much chemical work. Uh, they will not turn into fat. What happens? You're at dinner and you eat a big plate of rice or a couple of baked potatoes. You have a big carbohydrate load for dinner. Now, is that going to turn into fat? Mm -mm, the body's not going to do that. What really happens? What happens is that those sugar molecules will replete your glycogen stores. You'll uh, uh, you'll, you'll stock up your muscles with the stored sugar they need and the rest of the energy that's in your bloodstream, um, your body's going to burn it off as heat. Um, you'll, uh, your, your body temperature will go up a quarter of a degree, you'll stick your foot out from under the covers or throw the covers off and you'll radiate that heat off into space. Uh, they will not turn into fat. Okay, so once glycogen stores are replete, excess carbohydrates are burned off as as um, yeah, heat. Um, the, the Chinese folks, before the Western food got there, they would eat two pounds of rice a day, and they're skinny folks because it, carbohydrates will not turn into fats. Okay? okay, I hope everyone's clear on that. So let me go to the last scientific concept, but it explains the riddle of the, of the overweight vegan. The concept is called oxidative priority. What does that mean? It means that it's easier to burn sugars to blow apart that glucose ring than start chopping these long chain fats apart and burning the fragments, which is a dirty fuel. It leads to ketones and all sorts of things. So oxidative priority means it's easier to burn sugars than burn fats, okay? So what? So what means that if you eat sugars and fats at the same time, your body will burn the sugars for energy and you'll store the fats for later, for famine times, for there's a primitive metabolic reflex that your body does. So if you eat sugar and fats at the same time, you'll burn the sugars and store the fats. Well, that right away should explain to you why people in the West and my country and yours are getting so freaking fat, because they're eating fat and sugar all day. And with the 
bacon and eggs and toast, they'll, they'll burn the sugar in the toast and they'll store the fat in the bacon and the egg yolks. The, the burger, they're going to uh, burn the sugar in the bun and the sugar in the ketchup. They'll store the fat in the meat and the cheese. Uh, the fried chicken and the potatoes, they will burn the sugar in the baked potatoes. They'll store the fat in the vegetable oil in the fries and in the chicken fat. And ice cream is fat and sugar. Couldn't ask for a better weight gain food, even vegan ice cream, it's fat and sugar. You'll burn the sugar, store the fat, okay? And so again, look at all the combinations, all these classic, the steak and potatoes. You burn the sugar in the potatoes, you store the fat in the, in the meat. Pizza, unfortunately, is one of the best weight gain foods because you burn the sugar in the starchy crust, you'll store the fat and the cheese and the sausage, okay? Now, okay. So, if you've got that concept, then that allows you to solve the riddle of the overweight vegan. Because, if you like almond butter and jelly sandwiches, you are going to burn the sugar in the jelly, you'll burn the sugar in the bread, you're going to store the fat in the almond oil. If you put vegan margarine on your baked potato, you're going to burn the sugar in the starchy potato, you're going to store the fat in the margarine. If you like potato chips, potato chips are just vehicles for the vegetable oil they were fried in. They are pure fat and sugar. The sugar's in the starch of the potato, the oil is in the frying oil. The same with the, with the French fries, They're, they are fat and sugar. So yes, French fries are fat. And you want to be a heavy vegan? Pour oil on your pasta. Duh! Uh, that's going to be that fat-sugar combo. And all baked goods, all the cookies and the cakes, even though they're vegan, what is holding that cookie dough together? There's got to be a fat in there. That's what's holding the pastry flour together. So vegan baked goods are fattening because they're that fat and sugar combo. <laughs> she puts oil on her pasta, right? So, so the folks who are struggling, well, gee, all my cookies at home are vegan. Why can't I lose this weight? Because you're eating fat and sugar in those cookies, okay? So what you want to do is separate the two. So here's how to become a lean vegan, okay? First and foremost, and beyond weight loss, just for health. Rule number one, keep your belly full of whole plant foods with high water content. All whole vegetables are mostly water anyway, but these glorious soups and the chilies and the stews and the steamed vegetables and the salads and the fruit, they're mostly fiber and water. You, know, you pee it out, it doesn't stick to you. The water goes out in the urine, the, uh, the fiber goes out in the stool, and you wind up nice and lean. So eat, when we say whole plant foods, one of the advantages is it makes you lean because whole plant foods are mostly fiber and water. Okay? Now, what do we do about the things we like to eat here? You want to avoid eating the fat and sugar at the same time. As I said, now the sugars won't turn into fat, but they will keep you, if you are heavy, pure sugars will keep you from dipping into your own fat stores and burning that down. Okay? When the paleo folks, oh, sugars make you fat. No, they don't. But if you're eating sugar all day, if you keep munching sugary stuff, uh, uh, even fruit all day, well, you're never going to lose weight, but it's not because the sugar is turning into fats, it's just because you're burning that off and no reason for your body to burn off uh, the sugar, the fat on your hips. So what do you do about baked potatoes? You enjoy them, but don't put earth balanced margarine on it, put, put salsa on it, put a little spray of Bragg's liquid aminos, put something non-fatty on the starchy vegetables. Okay? That's how you can enjoy the starches without them putting weight on you. So starches are clean burning fuels. And the rice and the corn and the quinoa and the buckwheat, yay! Uh, they are, do not be afraid of these. But don't serve them with oils and fats. That's what causes the problem. But absolutely, eat whole potatoes and yams and sweet potatoes, they're wonderful. The breads, uh, you want to avoid the, the obviously sugary flour products, but the uh, 
breads, if they're just flour and water, then they're going to be okay. Now, if you're trying to lose weight, what do you do about avocados and nuts? Eat them, but not with starchy vegetables and sugars. Then eat them with your greens. Put the avocados on your salad. Make a tahini dressing, but pour it on the broccoli. Okay? So separate the fats and the sugars. But please hear this, everybody. This is just for people who need to lose weight. If you're already lean, do not pay any attention to this. Eating should not be an anxiety-producing event. If you're already lean, you can have some avocados with your, with your rice. It's not a big deal. This is for the people who are already vegan, but they're stuck with extra weight. If you're already lean, do not drive yourself nuts with this. Okay? Okay. Uh, um, if you're, now, because it takes about four hours to burn through a uh, starch load, if you have your potatoes at noon, all the afternoon goes by, you burn off the sugars, and dinner time, that's when they have your fats. Okay? And again, this is just for the, uh, uh, for the folks who need to lose weight. But again, uh, you want to eat a, uh, keep your belly full of high carbohydrate, high water foods. If you're already vegan and you're not losing weight, it's because you're doing one of four things. Number one, you're eating oils. Liquid fat in a bottle, okay? Uh, the less oil you eat, is, uh, the better and none is best. Um, you can slick your pan with a little film of oil, but that's it. Don't put two tablespoons of oil on your, in your pan and think you're doing something healthy. You're not. No reason to consume oils at all, and I submit you're healthier if you don't. Um, okay, we've already been there. Okay, the second thing, if you're not losing weight, it's because you're eating flour products, there's that fat-sugar combo. Um, and by the way, high, these high sugar intakes are one of the main reasons triglycerides are up. If your triglycerides are up, cut back on the sugars. Third reason, if you're not losing weight, there may be hidden dairy um, in your foods, and uh, get rid of it. You are not a baby calf. You don't need to eat baby calf growth fluid. <laughs> and finally, you're eating late at night. I won't go into physiology, time is getting on here, but um, uh, don't eat late at night. It keeps your body from burning fat. Okay, if you're not hungry in the morning, just drink water. You don't have to eat solid food at all. Uh, choline is a molecule that you need for brains and uh, membrane function. Um, it's found in plant foods. Quinoa, soy milk, broccoli has a lot of key of choline. Uh, so, if, uh, so make sure you, these show up in your diet on a regular basis. But remember the, the scary reports, oh, the vegan's going to run short, because their intake may fall below the recommended allowance, which are done on, on, with, on meat eaters. If you're vegan, your physiology changes. You may well absorb more choline from your food. Your liver may process it differently. Your gut bacteria change. They uh, metabolize it less aggressively. All the way around, uh, don't be scared by this. Just eat your greens, uh, eat your soy, uh, eat your broccoli. You should be fine. Paleo diets, I know I'm running way low here, way, way long. Paleo diets, avoid carbohydrates. They, uh, uh, they make you fat, the paleo folks say, nonsense. But people lose weight and they feel better because the paleo folks say that, well, uh, don't stop eating dairy and flour and oil and these folks lose weight. Yay, and they feel better, their lipids get better. But the, but the paleo folks and their doctors get seduced by these early changes. It's a diet of death. You pass these early benefits, you keep packing your colon full of meat three times a day. This is a great way to give yourself colon cancer. It's a great way to give yourself heart attacks, strokes, leaky gut that's going to give you autoimmune disease. The fat's going to make you diabetic. Uh, you're going to get inflammatory bowel disease. And the doctors are recommending this. I say, are you going to be around in 10 years when these people pass their bloody stool from their colon cancer? You're not going to be around, but you're passing out this advice. Do no harm includes dietary advice as well. And the last thing. <clears throat> the 
The reason why paleo dyes, these flesh-based dyes, are absolutely reprehensible is the reality of where they come from. The industrial scale meat production is the driving force of every environmental disaster we face. It's why the forests are being cut down, the, why the water is disappearing, why the soil is eroding. It's why these bears are on the icebergs due to our insatiable appetite for animal flesh. What's the answer? Vegans should know, but just in this context of history, we have used meeting up. It's done. No matter what the... No matter what the cavemen ate, no matter what the mighty hunters, it doesn't matter. We've used that page. It's time to turn the page. And we've used fishing up. We've used the oceans up. It's time to let them heal. What's the answer? Money is the issue. If, we, if people stop buying the meat, if it rots in the case, they'll stop producing it and we'll switch to plant-based foods. So it's up to the vegans to lead the way. And if you need some uh, an indicator of how ripe the, the society is getting, I hope you all saw this editorial in the New York Times this week to say it's time to stop making fun of the vegans. We all have to become more vegan. If we're to succeed in that, we have to start by saluting vegans, not mocking them. And the best lines of the article, it's, it's time at least refrain from putting down the people who are trying to light a path to a livable future. The vegans are right. The vegans were always right. The least you can do is shower them with respect and our gratitude because they deserve it. Now that said, I'm delighted. Look at the KFCs, they're lined up outside the door to eat the mock chicken and uh, the possible burger, wonderful, that's great if it helps that transition happen. We've used flesh eating up no matter how much of a part of our society it's been. There's a lot of things we used to do that we no longer do. We used to hunt and kill whales. We don't do that anymore. We used to buy and sell black people in my country. We don't do that anymore. Well, there's going to come a time where, well, we used to raise millions of cattle and slaughter them. Uh, we don't do that anymore. If we can get this world up on a plant-based diet, the world will heal, the forests will come back, they'll take carbon dioxide out of the air, the soils will stabilize, the waters will run pure again, there'll be enough food to feed everybody, the wars will stop. Being a vegan world is a, a, a viable world, it's a living world, it's our best chance. <clears throat> The farmers and ranchers aren't the enemy. We need to help them transition to do something else with the land. Grow broccoli, grow vegetables, grow fruit trees. Those are our friends. My medical colleagues are, are laggards. They're holding back. They're, they're trying to prevent uh, uh, their patients from having viable, vital information. I'm spending my life going around to the medical schools giving the students the lecture I wish I had gotten, that it's, you're not going to be seeing leprosy and smallpox, it's diabetes and obesity from what your patients are eating. Get real with your patients. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, go to, uh, uh, go to my website and uh, see our uh, Moving Medicine Forward initiative. If you want to learn more about plant-based diets, I've got a video called Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet. We deal with all the pitfalls there. So what do you do? Where does it leave us? It's a big task we're faced with, but do what you can where you are with what you have to make it a more vegan world. We have no choice and we have little time. The resources are all around. 
Living a vegan life is the key to creating a livable, viable future for us all, and you hold the key. If we all do our very best with what we have, with where we are, we'll make it a vegan world, safe for these wonderful children here, uh, and we'll all celebrate together. Thank you very much.